1159 at Radio Free America, and this is Uncle Sam with music and the truth until dawn. Right now, I've got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the walls. The chair is against the walls. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans, another day closer to victory. And for all of you out there on or behind the line, this is your song. Hey, and welcome everybody to our Daily Gun Show. Come to you live every day at 7 p.m. Eastern. That's 4 Pacific. For about an hour or so every day. Come uh, with three live or three gun-related subjects, different subjects throughout the week. We're recording it live on YouTube and simulcasting it over at gunchannels.com. Uh, then we uh, take the audio from the recording and post it as a podcast on iTunes. So listen to the show now or in the future to give us some feedback on whatever platform you might be listening on so we know where you are. And it helps get the show recommended to other listeners. So we do appreciate that favor. There are hosts. Three of us are here today. We've got Dano jumping in from Illinois. Thanks for joining. Yep. Thanks for the invites. Glad to be here. Yep. Then we got Z jumping in from Hawaii. Aloha. And then I'm down here in Arizona. So uh, still don't know where Bob is. And I didn't throw a link out to Smeggy, so I don't know if he's out there. Uh we're on, I'm on location right now. We're uh, coming. We're starting up episode. Uh oh, do we not have a number next? Oh, no, I scrolled over. Two forty-six. Two forty-six. So uh, we're we'll talking about what's going on this week, uh, and then uh, this today we'll be talking about how to use social media and uh, gun tech. But before we get into what we're talking about today, we usually take a break at the beginning to talk about what might have happened overnight. Okay. Well, I don't have anything in particular, but I'm not going to steal somebody else's thunder, so I'll roll that one over to someone else. Had a great scheduling show on Saturday. We did. So we uh, part of our um, commitment to making the show better, right, is to uh, schedule the show out ahead of time. That's our goal. We did that. So we have the school show scheduled out for us in February into the end of March, really. And our next uh, challenge will be then to schedule in more guests like we had Squib on last week. And uh, um, have more of that, hopefully every week going forward, so that keep the show as interesting as possible. We also had a good chance, an opportunity to get a lot of feedback from uh, Patreon supporters. So uh, most of that feedback is the Second Amendment stuff. Seems to be the most uh, requested topics. So uh, that's good insight. And as of Friday, they did get over the 100,000 mark on the uh, one petition in particular. That's true. And I've seen a lot of, well, there's some action on the, the other one, I guess, the Hughes one. But then there's uh, other petitions now. There's one to bring back the Russian ammo. And I think I saw a, a third one or a fourth one, I guess. Yeah. Just for an so update, the repeal of the NFA is currently at 132,000. So that's great news. The scenario is it wasn't even to 32 last week, right? Right. At this time. Yeah, it so, hadn't even broke 10,000, I don't think. So I guess that's given people encouragement to uh, start new petitions and to keep signing, which is good, because obviously the more momentum it can get, the more effective it's going to be. All right, well, um, probably missing stuff, but we'll dig into the show. We are starting a little bit late. Sorry, it's because we're on location here and always issues with uh, doing things remotely, I guess. So we're going to start out with talking about the show itself for the week. Uh, like I say, we're going to talk about social media on Mondays for our um, Gun Challenge University segment. We'll talk about cameras today. Uh, the Gun Tech segment today, we're going to talk about minimum number of rounds for the various calibers. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be doing our Second Amendment segment. We update in the Hearing Safe Protect or the Hearing Safe Act. Should people wait for it to pass or keep applying? And uh, that's an interesting topic that's got all kinds of, a, uh, I guess, good and bad to it. Speaking of good and bad, we have a good idea, bad idea, and it'll be California compliance parts. And then we have our Q and A segment on Saturday or on Tuesdays. We've been talking about changing that up, though, right? And calling that. I forgot now what we're calling that one. Um, then we got our CCW subject on our sub segment on Wednesday. We'll be talking about traveling while working, carrying a firearm like truckers or people that are commuting or doing stuff like that. 
Uh, our entertainment segment on Wednesday will be uh, the Gun Channel's Book Club. Uh, then we have our tactical quiz on Wednesdays. Of course, any time throughout the week, at any moment, we could have our tactical pop quiz also. So. And then we got. Is it happening right now? False alarm. False alarm. All right. So then on Thursday we'll have gun stuff. One of our newer newer segments this week: twenty-two LR or nine millimeter. So I don't know where that one will go. Our training. <laughs> All kinds of I want to know who thought that was even a question. Well, it's not a question. It's just a subject in which to, to talk about. Exactly. Clearly, that came up after I left on Saturday. Oh, well, no. This stuff was all scheduled out ahead. We, we started on Saturday. We were scheduling like February 17th on. Well, that's yep. true. So this one snuck in on you. So let's see. Training on Thursday will be, let's see, how the introduction of body armor made a chain intact made a change in training and tactics. That could be interesting. Oh, that's um, going to be good. We talk about shooting events on Thursdays. So if anybody's got any events that you're aware of or that we don't already have on the calendar over at Gun Channels, anybody can post stuff in there. So feel free to do so. We talk about them on Thursdays. Uh, let's see. Friday, we'll have our alternative gun topic. And we're going to talk about how to get tax exemption or deduction for ammo as part of Homeland Security. So uh, actually, Wait, a we just bit did that, I thought. No, we just talked a bit about it on Saturday, but more like in preparation for what we're going oh, to talk okay, about. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and we were generally just talking about gun to get people's uh, creative juices flowing, and that's where we kind of just sidetracked on that one for a bit. But that's the nature of live stuff, so we'll talk about it twice, kind of. Excellent, anyway, and that's a good one, too. Exactly. So gun business on Friday will be Manufacturer of the Month. We're going to spotlight Bill Geisley. Podcast. You're the one that parked like that, so don't fucking eyeball me. So uh, weekly wrap up. Uh, we basically do the opposite of this on Friday. <coughs> Sorry, some guys. I'll tell there. you what our consensus was on the subjects that we are, are broaching this week. Yeah, and uh, ideally, I think my my concept is to make the Friday show something that if people only listen to one show of the week, they listen to Friday. It's also when we build the Patreons who are supporting the show. So we want to make the Friday show, if they only listen to the one show, they can at least get a wrap-up and find out if something else was worth listening to. Yeah! All right, well, I think that, that's about it. So we'll dig into the second segment of the show today, which will be cameras. And before we do that, we like to take a break between the first and second segment to feature one of the members over at Gun Channels. Uh, as we mentioned, Gun Channels is a community we built a while back, focused on firearms. It's uh, completely membership driven. And with that in mind, we like to feature a member every single day. Today we're featuring Moon Food. It's been around for a long time. Auto Loader. You know, I guess you may know him as Auto Loader over on the uh, Instagrams. Uh, I think he's Moon Food on YouTube too, though. Got to be one of the Moon Food 78, I think. I'm not, I don't remember if he ever dropped the 78 on uh, YouTube or not. Uh, definitely an OG. Uh, been around in the chats for a long time. Been around in the external chat for a long time. Definitely, yep. uh, I count him as one of my bros. For sure. He's also out there designing stuff and doing uh, all kinds of the Instagram, right? Oh, my well, yeah, he, was, he was taking photos and stuff before he was ever even involved in Instagram. And he knows how to take a compliment, damn it. Because he's out there in the chat right now, oh, basking in the glory that is the Gun Channel's appreciation. And I can't talk back. They're talking about me. That drives me crazy. I'm saying that must be how he feels. Because I know how he's... Oh, no, he basks in the, in the warm glow. You know it, Dano. He's probably got a smile on his face. Now, I'm not saying it's a shit-eating grin, but it could be. You never know what that guy... Um, and clearly this is, uh, I'm not sure what G-Webs is up to, but, uh, it looks like, uh, if we're done praising the moon foods, it looks like we're going on to the Gun Channels, uh, university. Yep. Might which is, here. uh, about cameras today, it looks like. Am I still here? Yep. Yes, you are still here. You just weren't saying much. Just not relative. That's so, a joke. Um, wow. <laughs> 
So I think uh, phones are basically the best cameras available to right now, just because they can be in our pockets. We all have them with us most of the time, and uh, they're super powerful. And they're getting more powerful all the time, it seems. I'm going to disagree with the the best portion of your statement. I will say the most utilitarian or, or easily usable. I'll definitely give you on that. But what I've seen people be able to do with an SLR and then with the monopod and a boom mic coming off of it with a muslin is ends up turning out to be pretty good quality video and sound. And to me, being a photographer, that's something that, you know, you used to have to carry the shoulder mounted rocket launcher uh, camera to be able to get all of that kind of stuff going. So I definitely think that uh, cameras have improved. And like you're saying, they're smaller. And especially when you're talking about the phone cameras, they are definitely getting better. The video is getting better. The sizes, the size, the file size, excuse me, has gotten better. But uh, when you got a, uh, when you put one of those SLRs on a monopod, you can also put an external light on it. You can also have, uh, like I said, the uh, shotgun mic on it with a muslin. And all of a sudden, depending on the camera, you could be shooting in 4K. I mean, boom. You know, that that's simple. Um, and now also to these days, um, with uh, some of those SLRs, you can also, it, uh, what do you call it? Like, it's not like it's Bluetooth, but it can easily s send uh, information or images, whether it's to your phone and or uh, like a, a tablet or what have you, so that, you know, if especially when it comes to editing or seeing, or the other person there that's seeing what you got on film, well, not on film, but you understand what I'm saying, what your file looks like. It, it's amazing what those things can do these days. But I mean, it's amazing to be honest with you what your phone can do, actually, too. Uh, to be honest, it it can it is truly amazing. Yeah, I mean, uh, take away from what the SLRs can do. I guess I'm calling the camera or the phones best only because of their convenience, and that means it's sort of like the the best gun you don't carry with you every day versus the adequate one that is with you every day. I guess that's what I'm saying is that because they're so powerful and effective for at what they are in the oh i'll definitely agree with you on that g and that's why I, I don't know if i said efficiency or ease of use or something like that because i definitely agree with you i mean the fact that it fits in your pocket and it has all of that power all that storage gets you onto the net or it posts it quickly if that's what you need right so i mean it is pretty amazing i was just simply adding to that that like if you are a person that's trying to intentionally uh, up your game on you know, the production value of your content it is now also easier and somewhat more affordable to be able to do that than it was in the past. I mean, like I said, you remember what it was to have one of them shoulder-mounted bad boys, uh, and those were never cheap. Well, and I think that you're right to get cutting edge. It's still not cheap, but considering how fast things change and uh, how little things are worth years after you know they're they're made like you can get into really good stuff inexpensively. It's just maybe not the best stuff that's out there today. And not the not the newest and latest. I'll and again I'll definitely agree with you on that, buddy. But and then uh, that's like years ahead of film and lenses. You got a butt there, Dano? No, that's right. Keep keep going. You sure? Yeah, that was it. We're done. Oh, all right. We lost the cameras. I think. I don't know. What else do we want to say about them? They're uh, definitely, you can get into them at any level, right? So you can just start with whatever's on your phone. Uh, yep. You can get Snap, whatever you call like a, what do you call the those? Phone? Like a, no, 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 like a, just a snapshot type of camera, like a quick, easy little digital Oh, camera. yeah, yeah. Big yes, they still store. make those even. Probably 30, 40 bucks, and they're handy. And if you are going to be taking a lot of pictures, they have the advantage of going straight from the camera to the to the storage device and then straight to your computer for editing where the phone is a little cumbersome and can be slow because the phone isn't really well and i don't want to say that it's more likely for there to be a data corruption or a chance for it between the phone the cord and the computer than there is usually from the storage device like an sd card or something because i mean you can fry an sd card uh taking it out sometimes with a static charge 
Um, not that that happens very often. Just speaking from having, you know, shot cameras seven days a week for a decade and a half now. That, uh, but that's a lot of time. How often? And exactly. And, and and here's the thing: those cards, uh, the worst ones, used to be the compact flash cards. Those were the ones that I would burn, and you, dude, you you'd lose the freaking day's work. And let's say there's some splaining to do with that. But uh, it, whether it's the shielding or just the way that they make the cards now, it's a lot. It's a lot easier, and you usually don't have that problem as much. Um. I think you do have the problem of taking the card out and dropping it or losing it or figuring out which card out of 50 of them it is. It, oh, truly. Yeah, if you're not labeling them or whatever, yeah, you're going to put each one in either a viewer or back in the camera. Or if you're really going to put them in the computer, each one, then you're potentially creating problems for yourself in the future. But, but still uh, film and the knowledge you used to have just to run a camera back in the day you just around with no consequences nowadays and no cost at really at all. And by way of comparison, dude, you are a hundred percent correct on that. Uh, it was so expensive just to practice and learn. And it was so cumbersome and slow because you could take all your different exposures and everything you did on your camera as you were learning the camera procedures, but then you'd get your film developed and depending on how much of that you recalled or retained from, time you took it to what kind of notes you took or whatever to like you know what you got finished product from the developer that's a heck of a lot of keeping track of stuff and then all that did is give you some basic knowledge for those lighting circumstances yep. and setting up so the fact that you can just once you figure out your basic so or whatever you want to call your white balance little effect lever on your phone um you don't have to know anything other than wiggle your finger back and forth and no, and that is the great thing, dude, because your camera is the one that went to college. Your your phone is the one that went to college. It has a degree, you know? Yep, and it puts all the little things that are necessary just within finger wiggling. And uh, Something I'd like to throw out there that's really not technical, I guess it's much more social, is, is the huge uh, advances that have been made uh, in bringing uh, information that used to remain hidden to, to our general knowledge, and I'll give you a couple different examples of it because of the cell phone and the camera that's built in there. Uh, whether it's uh, uh, police officers behaving improperly, or whether it's uh, other events that are transpiring since almost since so many people have cameras nowadays, events that used to be uh, hidden or they were alleged and then were never truly investigated, the truth never came out one way or the other is now since so many people have cameras and, and you know including at various officials that uh, uh it the, the likelihood of getting some actual unbiased information is a possibility where before um i'm thinking like before the 90s so i'm really going way back here we just had to take an individual's word i mean the, the chances of getting it literally on screen were nearly impossible so the advent of having almost every other person or every third person with a smartphone and then being able to video record it is huge. I hear you, but I'm going to say there's just as much opportunity for uh, those times when the best, when the uh, the cops on the beat stop and play basketball with the kids, or um, you know somebody saves a life or something, and you know that kind of stuff. It's on well, I'm going to add a third dynamic to that because I'm going to agree with Dano on the it has kept or called to the carpet more people than it had in the past. I'm going to agree with G-Webs on that it does also allow to show the good in the world, but I'm going to add a third dimension to it, gentlemen. Unfortunately, it also has a voyeuristic effect in that some people are more willing to film it than yeah. help. And, and that's true. And, and, and that the example I gave was merely meant as an example. I don't have any axe to grind when it comes along. No, no, but, but, you're, but you're right, though. I mean, whether it's body cameras for the police doing it to protect themselves, so to speak. Right. Or if it's cameras of some type of action happening or something like that. And then I also agree with G-Webs. I've definitely seen more uh, 
two-step detectives and uh, uh, the electric slide and basketball and somebody taking somebody to dinner. And, like, I've seen way more feel-good stories also come out um, due to, excuse me, due to uh, the advent of the ability of the cell phone camera. And just because, it, like you said, like both of you guys said, it's everywhere. Like, who doesn't have a camera on their cell phone right now? But to me, that's that's by far the, the 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 greatest attribute of the cell phone is the world it's given us eyes to that before we were hidden from. Right, but I also want to reiterate the little point that I made was that unfortunately, it's also created or facilitated. I guess would be a better way of putting it uh, for a person to film instead of help sometimes. And, and uh, to be honest though, that depends on the person. Not every person is going to do that. There are going to be people that are going to help instead of film and stuff like that. There's, there's always been gawkers. It's just now they're gawkers with a phone instead of just standing there watching and pointing, watching and pointing and filming. But we've always had people that would not step in and help. But like we've also always had some people that will step in and help even to their own detriment. So I don't ever want to act like we don't have those people in the world, too, because we certainly do. Yep. Now, what else do we got? How do you social media here with cameras? I mean, are we're talking Instagram. We're talking Facebook Live, which seems to be a newer thing these days. We still have Hangouts here and we got YouTube videos. I mean, whether that's the cell phone camera, there's more. There's just more and more content being created for all of that stuff. Did I mention Snapchat? That's another one. Vimeo? Uh, well, Vimeo is like a service almost like um, you post your, almost like YouTube. Yeah, you, you post your com content there. It's YouTube except that you pay for the account there. So you pay for the space and the storage and then uh, you pay for like the bandwidth that people are pulling. So it's it's the services that YouTube provides, but since you're paying for it, none of the um, requirements or restrictions, I guess, that YouTube infringes on you. Well, and what I usually see on Vimeo is usually uh, musicians or entertainers. They have Vimeo channels for the most part. So I don't know whether necessarily the label's paying for it, the artist is paying for it, whatever, but... And usually it's uh, not uh, because what they do on those Vimeo channels is I see like it'll be an actual like when MTV used to play an actual video from somebody like, you know, it's copyrighted material or whatever. But that artist can play that on their Vimeo channel with no, uh, you know, I don't know whether they get uh, like if they get clicks or likes on something like that, if it goes into their, you know, contracted uh, pay or something like that. I have no idea how that works because I'm sure that there has to be some kind of payback for Vimeo if you have to pay to utilize it. There has well, to be you something. Well, like, you to put stuff on there. And for us, for example, it's like $50 a year or something. So if you don't use a lot, it's not a very substantial cost. It's just that it costs something so you you don't have to deal with the like terms and conditions that a free service might put on there. Okay. And it's sort of also you got the liability if you put something up that's in trouble and it's you. Okay. I was talking about having access or the ability to get things recorded or documented or archived. And that's another thing that the phones provide, not just the interactions between individuals, but for example, when we had a chance to go down to the basement of the NRA Museum in Virginia, um, you know, that's the kind of thing where, um, you know, how many spur the you know, unplanned uh, unplanned situations like that? Somebody pulls a camera out, and now there's this documentation of something that might only be seen by a few eyeballs normally. And now because yep. somebody was able to record it, you know, now it's there for the posterity. Exactly, it's preserved for posterity. It's definitely something that is able to be shared so that more eyes get on it, like you're saying. And it's a, it's an awesome thing. Because you didn't roll in there with a camera, like, you know what I'm saying, the, the shoulder-mounted camera, uh, expecting to broadcast to the world, but the fact that you had it in your pocket uh, made it happen, you know? All right, with that, I think, uh, not seeing what other uh, questions might be coming. Uh, 
That's right, boys and girls. It's time. It's time. It's time for the tactical pop quiz of the day. I know you've all been waiting patiently. So, Mr. Official, have you seen the question? And more importantly, the answer. If you're talking, I can't hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry about Sorry. that. No, that's okay. I didn't realize I was muted. All right. Uh, I'm going to read the question. I'm going to read it twice. So those of you over on YouTube, get your fingers lim limbered up. Get ready. Those of you on gun channels, you know what to do. So all right, here we go. What was the first successful gun design of Eugene Stoner? Once what? again, first successful gun design of Eugene Stoner. Bing. Bing, 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 bing. We got Angry American. We got Angry American with the AR-5 survival rifle picked up by the United States Air Force. Congratulations, Angry. You know where to go? And that is dailygunshow.com slash pop quiz. Fill out the form. Put your first, second, and third choices. I know you've heard me say it a million times. Well, maybe not a million, but a hundred times maybe. But head on over there and fill it out. Congratulations. Good job, Angry American. Welcome back to the winner's circle. Way to start the week off with a win, buddy. That makes you technically, of course, you know it. You've heard it. You love it. You live it. The tactical pop quiz. Hot shot for today. And on that note... And, I can't remember where we were, so I think we're getting into gun tech. Yes, sir. Rounds for each caliber. I don't understand how this is a gun tech question, but uh, I, I thought I'm, it was, sounds more like a shaming question. Well, no, I don't think so at all. Um, now here's okay. Here you go. I see what it's saying now. I thought it was like how many. Uh, bullets and whatnot, okay? But, like, it says 6 for 45, 10 for 40, 15 for 9 millimeter. Now, number one, it technically should say 7, I think, for 45, because isn't that what John Moses Browning designed the 1911 with? Unless they're thinking 45 Colt or something for a revolver. So I guess what I'm saying is minimum number of rounds for caliber, i.e., and, I again, I would say 7 for 45, and what is it actually 12 for 40 how many um what's the base depends number the, i guess it depends on the gun but the concept i think or the way i'm reading it is that oh uh, the smallest and, uh, my bad what well it says the minimum so it's the smallest amount for each caliber oh okay so i was reading it i guess like as the calibers were invented like uh, like the capacity being a characteristic of the caliber or something, but yeah, I guess if it's the minimum, what's the minimum? Probably and the now I see why he put six for forty-five because isn't that the like the Glock thirty-six? Does that mean like minimum to defend yourself, or what does that mean exactly? Minimum for what? Probably minimum capacity of a firearm because the other things wouldn't be something that have a number. You know, if you're talking stopping power or something like that, that that's not something that can be calculated with a finite number. Whereas Correct. talking like the most common or the most the smallest forty five you could get would probably be the single stack. Yeah, like an officer's uh forty five eight. No, like again, the thirty six from Glo the Glock thirty six is six rounds. The exactly. defender yeah. is it is six rounds, I think. Well, you can get a double tap with two. Well, there you go. Well, then, see, that's exact. All of a sudden, now, yeah, you're throwing that out there because we literally the question or statement does say minimum number of rounds. So then it would be the um, what are those things? The uh, those single single shot derringers. Yep. In almost every the caliber. Heiser, well, the Heiser double tap or whatever. 
no no there's like the calico or something makes a single barrel yeah. oh they make like 45 and 9 and probably 380 maybe 22 so uh, i guess single single barrel derringer would be your ultimate answer to these but talk about various small single stack 45s now there's small nines with single stacks for whatever reason people made those so uh i don't know what you mean like a 43 is it a 43 yeah everybody makes a little single stack nine like ruger makes one right i don't know if smith mothers yeah i guess they make the yeah the shield so yeah those are what six usually in nine i think yeah. so yeah i mean the, the shield is i think is it might be a seven but most of them tend to be a six plus one well little 40s do they they don't make little singles 40s i don't think for, they can handle um the Ramy by cz technically is a single stack yep um i don't know that it's single stack but i just remember that it was like nine or ten rounds at most like maybe even eight what's i mean i don't think i remember seeing a six round 40 anywhere nobody makes a single stack 40 slim line or anything do they not that i'm aware of but then again what i'm aware of is, is not the sum total of the firearms business either that's true so that's why we have the uh comments out there it doesn't look like we're seeing too much uh as far as 40. Uh, no chris says there's oh there you go he does say shield yep yep what and uh ca the car basically chris said that the single stack 40 inch uh, sh shield from smith and wesson and then robbie and car carrier both said that car makes a six round 40 as well correct That is interesting. So it's not like it's a good idea, bad idea, but it's a, a minimum number of rounds per caliber. So what do you think minimum for 22 would be? Uh, the, the cricket, single shot. Nope. Or, or that um, I'm going to go five um, because uh, that's what an NAA carries, correct? No, I guess that's true. They're do they're single stack. Firearms no. event. It doesn't say, it doesn't say it has to be pistol. Right. No, it doesn't. But a single action revolver isn't necessarily the first thing that jumps to mind to most people for a no. defensive. Oh, but I agree with you on that, dude. There's like uh, your Ruger LCRs in twenty two. Right, but, but it doesn't say defensive either. Well, in no, that case, then then we already said single shot Derringers win. As far as absolute minimum, um, break action r rifle, in this case, well, on the twenty-two, we've been assuming pistols because it's he didn't say anything about like rifle calibers in there, but yeah, well, especially since we were talking forty-five and forty and nine. Not to say right. that there are, those don't come in carbine or, or rifles, but I mean, well, you, yeah. those are going to be like high capacity or max capacity mags, so they'll take whatever. And, you know, mags. there's. There's a shitload of twenty two rifles out there. Of course. Right. I mean, so how could we not count that when looking at the twenty two? Simple by thinking of pistols and revolvers. Yes. And keeping it the same. Yeah, modifying discussing the pistols. Okay. Smeggy. What's up? Say something. I have pertaining no to idea the topic. What this topic is. I don't get it. Well, mi minimum minimum number of like I just don't get it. Apparently, none of us get it. <laughs> well, I disagree with that statement, but well, uh, well. the subject of our show is not necessarily designed to give you some authoritarian like summary of how it is, as much as just to get a conversation going. So it's right. just a thought provoking. So, Smeggy, in your mind, what is, for example, I'm going to give you three calibers, and you tell me either the gun or what you think the minimum number of rounds would be that you, you would carry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add carry just for Smeggy's oh. question. Just for Smeggy's question. So I'm going to start with 45, Smegs. That changes the question entirely. It just does change the question. Now it's a Now it's a judgment call? Yep. I don't want the snowflake to melt. Oh, I... I don't know. What did we say that those little... Oh, no, no, no. No we. Have? No we. 
Well, I don't know nothing about no 45s. I, ha- I don't have my AARP card yet. How many fingers you got? I have eight fingers. There you go. So that sounds like a pretty good number of 45, don't it? Sure. There you go. See how easy that was? Well, how do you feel about 40? It's, well, it's all right. Probably around the same, I guess. Okay. I mean, I don't. I, that's the thing. I don't really know what most guns like hold and things like that. So that's fair. You know, you know he's never going to come back here if we keep treating him like this. Uh, he may be a picture of a snowman, but Smeggy is no snowflake. Smeggy can handle. That is true. Plus, he likes hockey, so I know he can take a hit and get right back up. Yeah. All right, and ain't nobody you. checking you up against the boards in here, bro. So. Our goal about, okay, and, and last but not least, how about nine millimeter? The minimum that I would carry of nine mil. Yep. yep. God, I'd I'd want at least like ten ish. Fair enough. Too bad that's Fair. wrong answer because that's not enough nine millimeters. Yeah, I, thought, I, don't, well, I actually I mean, thought I he was going to say an so. extendo is what I thought he was going to say. <laughs> you know, sometimes haters just going to hate. Or they just want to bring enough. There's no hate. Or There's no hate. They're just going to educate. Right? Don't hate. Yeah, and actually, I take that back because I have been looking at the shield in 9 mil. And I oh, think that's wow. like 7 or 8. and That seems okay. I think it's... I think it's seven is what the chat was telling us earlier. Yeah. Let's see. Well, is yes. that seven in the mag? So it's seven plus one. Yes. Or is seven that... plus one. Yeah. So you so then there you can get you can get eight in the thing. Okay. See on that one, I would do the plus one on my CZ I carry now. I don't bother doing the plus one. I just fill the mag up and then rack it. Because I'm rack like, it. what's I... It's too much effort to drop the mag and put one more bullet in and put it back in or whatever. I just never felt like doing that. Well, and what that caliber is that one? Been doing it on any other semi-automatic firearm. You put the mag in, you load one in, you drop the mag, you top it off. Well, I got a feeling the one he's carrying now has more than six or seven rounds. Oh yeah, it's it's the full size. You so know, what he's saying is, if he, had, if he had to take something that was smaller, like the shield, he would take the time. To add the plus one, yeah, whereas I would the one that he carries now already has fifteen I, I, or seventeen. Yeah, I'm not worried about the eighteen instead of seventeen. Right, right, right. I, I, and I see what you're saying there. Well, with that, I'm going to say let's move on. So, if you, like Sarah, no object anyway. So we'll uh, dig into I don't know gun movie of the day. Sure. Which leads us almost to we should you almost even mention Matt's chat. <laughs> Because Matt's know, chat man. top five today is going to be top five gun fu movies. It's true. That's probably the best one. One of the best ones. So it's definitely uh, one of the best. A movie every day that people might not have seen in a while, or if you're youngin, a movie you haven't seen yet. So uh, with that in mind, today's is the Replacement Killers. Chow Young Fat. Um, and what's her name? Uh, Mira Servino, right? Yeah. Yeah. She's a. She, and this is definitely in her, in her. Uh, in her prime. Thank you. I didn't want to be crude. Yeah, she's lo- she's lovely in this movie. She's awesome. As a, yeah, this is definitely a good. One. And there's lots of what, uh, the lighting in this one is like the. Oh, it's always telling the mood almost. Um, Nice and see now the gun channels chat is getting in another one. You mentioned Mira Sorvino. Um, lots of gunplay. And since it's a John Woo movie, right? There's there's all of the rotating and panning and three sixty sweep and all of that kind of good stuff. As far as like the filming of the fight scenes and stuff? Yep. Because that's like his that's his style. And this is when he must have been, I'm assuming it's an old movie, so this is when this guy was still learning or starting or establishing his credibility. No, that, like, uh, he'd been in Hong Kong and China and stuff like that for a, like almost a decade or so. This is just like happens to be one of his first like American movies, like full on in America for an American audience movies. He'd been doing it for probably a decade almost or more perhaps. No, it's a Before, good uh, movie 
for sure and a good gun movie but i like also that the plot of it or whatever is not typical it's not just your typical like this and this and the bad guy does this and the bad guy and the good guy does this and then everybody lives happily ever after it's over it was well, more and weird six uh I, plot. I definitely agree with you on that because it brings you to a different um a different place a different subset of of humanity so to speak um basically um you start to learn more about the under uh, criminal underworld and, and some of its inner workings through this movie. What it's like to live in Hong Kong. Well, and or be a criminal in Hong Kong as well. So did you guys see this movie? Everybody see it? Yes. It's been a while. But, I, I uh, have not seen it. Oh, Smegs, it. it's worth it. Yeah, you're going to be you're going to be happily surprised. It's a good one. I was too busy uh, working and raising little kids at the time. 1998. Flashback. Is that when it came out? 98? Sounds about yep. right. Wow. 20 years ago. Wow. All right. Well, that's the whole point of the show is to uh, remind people of movies you might not have seen in a while or might not have even seen. So uh, it looks like a bunch of people on the Gun Channel side have seen it. We're not seeing too much on the YouTube side. So uh, I think we put links in there to uh, where you can find it over on Amazon. I'm sure it's the kind of thing you can find in a dollar bin at this point. DVD for a dollar type of thing. I would think so. Dollar bin, potentially even on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Potentially. Uh -huh. I know I've seen it on Netflix before. I'm not sure about Amazon, but it'll come up. It's old enough that it'll come up in the rotation. All right, thanks, Dan. I'll oh, yeah. Out. Check out and go make some money. So, Adios, folks. Be safe out there, Dan. Have a good one. I think that can take us into Gun of the Day. Yeah, I'm ready for that. So normally I would... I can try to screen capture Take here. Look at the Ring of Fire collection here, and what we've well, we got Smeggy in here. Family. So uh, I'll throw the link out there because I'm not going to try to screen share with just one monitor here. But uh, today is the Lorson, uh, which is a company, uh, one of the uh, Ring of Fire guns. So uh, uh, one of the companies that came up after the 1968 Gun Control Act. Uh, stop the importation of inexpensive firearms from other countries. So domestic manufacturers started to create them. And uh, the thing in, in L.A., he was a aerospace parts manufacturer, so it was easy for him to change his factory stuff over to make little firearms. Two version of his 25 ACP, his daughter and her husband made a 32. Like, they upscaled the, the gun into a 32, and that was um, Davis. Firearms and or Davis Industries, and then uh, we have Lorson, who was a high school friend of the son. The son was Jennings, and uh, Lorson came along and started to make their own guns in every caliber. So they they're the first ones to sort of screw with the little system they had going there, or that had a had been created by the formulation of these other three factories or manufacturers. And Lorson was the least aware of what was going on in his facility so uh when smeggy and i went to uh did these places they're basically they let us walk right in and we just you know took came all out the machines and he didn't even um, notice these are all like you know places in industrial um centers so they're just you know right alongside of somebody making countertops or something how so in the f did there used to be so easy for someone to just start manufacturing firearms that, oh, the son did it, the stepfather did it after the dad did it because the daughter married the other guy, and then, oh, his buddy from high school decided to start opening up and manufacturing. How, like, was it something where all you had to do was have, like, some machining tools and boom, you're, you're a, a, a firearms manufacturer? I, I, I'm trying to grasp that because it seems to me to be a foreign concept. Every industry that I'm aware of, you have splits and people that think they can do it better and arguments and people that go out to prove their theory is better. So um, I think it was Fort Knox split off Liberty in Winchester. and Oh, I, I mean, I understand how that goes. I'm just saying, to me, my understanding was it's a lot harder to just all of a sudden start manufacturing 
firearms. That's well, what I'm I mean, saying. they obviously they had to jump through all the hoops and stuff as far as uh, getting the right licensings and all that stuff. But I think the biggest thing with this particular type of firearm is the one guy, like he did all the engineering and figured it all out, and they all just kind of tweaked it a little bit. Oh, so they all you know work. I mean, so it's like design. I gotcha. It's like well, how easy is it to brownies. start a car company? Well, you know what a car looks like now because someone else figured out how to do it, and you just put a different bumper on it, and you're good to go. Mm, but more like, uh, if you look at the, well, the specifically the Ring of Fire companies, but you can like say look at any industry. Like, why well, say Wilson? The people from Nighthawk got sick of working at Wilson. They went across the street and started Nighthawk. So th it happens all the time where somebody who's working somewhere says, oh, I know how to do this and I could probably do it better or whatever. And they decide to start another company and all they need is either investors or, you know, some kind of... Some kind of well, that's true because if you do have the know-how or the ability to hire somebody with the know-how, I, I see what you're saying, G. So as far as being regulated, I mean, it would be the same as if you were making whiskey and you wanted to start another whiskey factory. There would be whatever, like Smeggy's saying, whatever licensing and, and whatnot. But the machinery and everything is just like building plastic shopping bags or building, you know, guitar strings. It's just going to be getting some manufacturing or I mean some uh, some uh, tools and then getting actual tooling for the item you're making. And like you say, all that can be hired out. So it's just like any business plan. You just have to have the interest to do it. And I think what the Slurson guy probably saw was the amount of uh, money and profit that these guys were making in these various companies. So when well, you're talking about the dad starting a company, he already figured out how to do all the setting up a firearms manufacturer. So when his son started, I'm sure the dad helped him. And when the daughter and son-in-law started, of course, I'm sure they're going to, you know, they were, and you were said aware the of. And is the high school buddy or whatever, the school friend? Uh-huh. Okay. And... So he just must have been around watching it and been savvy enough to figure out, hey, that's working. Let me go do it too. And you did say that he was the one that was either not hands-on or not really watching as much of the quality control in his in his shop. Does that, or did I say it wrong? Did I did I misrepresent I what? You so you're saying it as much as anybody can because there's no there's no actual book about it or anything. There's just. Uh, Basically, what some of us have done as far as research, uh, looking at news articles, which are, of course, biased and agenda-driven, but then mixing that up with uh, occasionally over on the Zamic forums, where we talk about Zamic guns all the time, occasionally a factory worker will come in or somebody who claims to be a factory worker will come in and give us information about what it was like to work there. And That's based cool. on the amount of details they have, we I can only assume that these people know what they're talking, you know, that they are who they're representing themselves to be. So from those kind of insights, we've been able to figure out that, and I'm not saying Lorson was any worse or better than any of the other firearms manufacturers, because I can't imagine any firearms manufacturer who stays on this factory floor every day and monitors every single part of the process. You don't become a successful business person by working that hands-on. So I'm not going to suggest it's the guys let this happen, but for whatever set of circumstances, there were quite a few of these guns that were... Um, basically before they were serialized. So as you think about the machine of a firearm being created, you know, there's a piece of metal, it gets whittled or pressed or drilled or something. And at some point the government says now that one part is a receiver. So once it has that last hole drilled in it, it has to be documented. So usually they're going to go through some sort of a forging or finishing process. And then as their kind of last process is done where they're turned into receivers, they're serialized and then they're in books and they're, then secured a different way. So uh, it's that concept of the vague ass laws that are infringed upon us and the lack of any kind of enforcement or standardized enforcement or anything. So uh, whenever you have a situation where a bunch of parts exist and in one moment they're just parts and in the next moment they're firearms, if you make 7,000 of those things and 2,000 of them go missing before they're serialized, that's the kind of situation they oh. had over there. So, oh, and uh, again, what were they charging? Like, uh, could um, like what was a Phoenix or a, 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 a what it was a Larson like brand new MSRP or compared to like a Davis and the other ones? I imagine they were all pretty much similar in price. Yeah, I think they probably cost like fifteen dollars to make 
they wholesaled for like 75 oh, and they sold like 100. Wow. Okay, so you literally, you could go get one for 100 bucks, brand new. You can still get them for like 129 brand new. They don't make Lorsons anymore, but the inexpensive Bazamic guns are usually like 120 new, something like that. Wow. So I guess I, I can see now more of the affordability of becoming that particular type of, especially at that time, a firearms manufacturer. Because if, because like you said, you know, if you sold, if you made seven thousand, and you know, and they they sell them at a at a hundred bucks or whatever, you know, that's seven hundred thousand dollars right there. So I, I I'm starting to see the math a little bit now. Well, and that's part of the reason why. Uh... You know, the, they didn't like them. That's why, you know, like the politicians and stuff tried to crack down on them is because, you know, they were inexpensive guns. And so, you know, in their mind, like all these people could, you know, afford to get them. And apparently, you know, you have to have a lot of money in order to exercise your Second Amendment right. Because when too many people of low income exercise their Second Amendment right, they, you know, get all upset about it. And try and find ways to stop that. And G, did you say that the Lorsen came in multiple calibers, or it was just a twenty-two? No, they're the ones that started off basically selling them in twenty-two, twenty-five, thirty-two, uh, and probably thirty-eight, three eighty. Wow! 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 wow. Lorsen okay. is also uh, he wrote a book on business and. And also did he do? He did a couple of other businesses, and then he's been an entrepreneur a lot. And then uh, uh, started at least two, if I remember right, two different companies at the beginning of the whole polymer thing. So, you know, early '80s, '90s, uh, a couple of companies tried to start up as polymer framed versions of the Zamic guns, and three of them failed. All three of them failed, but uh, two of them were were Larsons. No kidding. So he kind of stayed in the game even after they tried to, to push him out due to overregulation and whatnot. Uh, Somewhat. I don't know enough about it to actually say yeah, or if he was just I don't know. I don't know his his intent on all that. If he was just looking for ways to make money, or if he was really seriously interested in developing firearms, or I'm not sure what his where his mind was on and all that. But the guns didn't work because of the technology, not because of business. They just, it was too early. They were using the wrong kind of plastics. Okay. The reason the kind of plastics you put on like a Keltec uh, Tech 22, you can't really make a pistol frame out of that. It required more of like that Glock polymer, which is stronger. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Um, in your opinion, where does the Lorsen rank in the Ring of Fire hierarchy <laughs> as far as either... The bottom uh, quality and or reliability bottom okay fair enough fair enough stupid. they're crappy and they, they're stupid there's nothing good about them at all but none, there's not that much great about any of the ring of fires but they're the least i would okay. consider the feeling of all of them and of course everybody's gonna have their own set of tools jennings possibly could be the least because that guy's a monster but uh the uh Larson guy isn't much better. He's just not quite a predator type of monster. He's just a dick kind of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> These aren't great people, so I don't look up to them. But okay. uh, interesting as far as their uh, interaction with everything, with firearms, as far as manufacturing. Well, it firearms. sounds like they cannibalized themselves a little bit. Well, they weren't good people, none of them really. So, um, I mean, I don't want to say none of them, but a couple of them were really bad, horrible people. So whenever horrible people do anything, even if it is something that should be successful, they may have temporary success in spite of their horrible nature, but they're still going to corrupt it and ruin it, which they did. Just because mm -hmm. they're evil inside, you know, they're bad people. And it's not that they had anything to do with them gun people. I mean, I'm sure there's farmers, they're dicks, and they do things that uh, ruin their businesses, too. That's true. Uh, there's jerks in just about every corner of business, or life, even. Not to say that they're all jerks, just to say that there are jerks. All right. Well, that was the day, and uh, we're uh, kind of focusing in on the video there. Uh, we're going to be doing some more of the Ring of Fires this week, and as I'm back at the regular computer setup, we'll kind of screen share some of those, I'm sure.
otherwise we sent the link out there you can take a look at some of the actual guns and I kind of relate them in that video to how they where they are uh, kind of uh, compared to the original Ravens and whatnot and uh, there I should probably link the two videos together when Smeggy and I were driving around LA we went to the Larson place and it's like I say it's weird they're all just you wouldn't know their firearms manufacturers really at all maybe when they were thriving they might have had signs out front of course and some of them might have had more signage than others but alive right now you can't hardly tell that they're gun companies either and that's probably for camouflage and for security right you don't need to let probably manufacture necessarily but um these business centers, these industrial centers with so many other businesses and stuff, it's just interesting to see. Um, you know, guns are just like anything else. They're just like any other widget or car part or you know, accessory for your popcorn machine or something. They just have to be made somewhere. And uh, yeah, it's not always a big elaborate thing like the uh, the uh, what should I say, the uh, Barrick factory was or like the Glock factory, you know, they have big campuses and you definitely know you're You're in a firearms manufacturer. These are definitely the opposite end of that spectrum The one was in with you know tire changing and place that was working on motorcycles and stuff fully incognito Yeah, exactly So let's see to bring it back um, Unless you have more on the Larson. No, probably go all day, but that's good enough. All right Because um, we were talking about cameras earlier you were talking about when you had a chance to go to the uh, National Firearms Museum in Virginia, and I believe that's our gun shop, gun stop for today. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about museums. So, yeah, we'll start with the uh, National Firearms Museum, the NRA Museum. It's right outside of D.C. It's really close to D.C., but it's technically Virginia because all those states are the size of, like, neighborhoods. So... Uh, uh, it's right outside of D.C. It's right off the highway. It's easy to get to. And if you're there, go across the street to the mall, and there's a awesome sushi buffet there. Oh, you can eat sushi buffet. But anyway, the museum itself is in the bottom. It's like the first floor, I guess, of the one of the towers there, the West Tower, I guess, if you think about it. There's two buildings at the NRA Museum with, like, a bridge between them, so it kind of looks like the letter H. And... Uh, uh, underneath of the one building is the range, and above the range, like on the first floor level, is the museum. So you just park there. It's just a museum, just a building, so you just park oh. there and walk in. And there's no appointments necessary. It's open to the public. It's free. So you just walk in and walk through the main door of the building, and then it's pretty obvious where the museum is. You just walk into the museum. I think they just started offering tours, which is pretty cool. So I would like I did, to. I did put links out uh, in both chats, both YouTube and gun channels, for the link for the NRA museum.org so that they can take a look and almost follow along with you. Right on. We did a video while we were there of the museum. I think we were live when we were there because in 12 we were already doing these live chats and stuff. So uh, we had a, uh, a live thing for briefly there, and then we kind of just self toured ourselves around. Knowing it was you, Marco, and Hosh, yeah? No, me no, and Hoss. Hoss, USMC, yeah. yeah. So um, we just kind of did a self-tour, and then afterwards they took us upstairs to their library and then to their curating room or whatever it is they call it, where they clean the guns and pick mm -hmm. them, pick them up for display or fix them, I guess. And then uh, that was kind of neat. That's what we've seen. I got to touch Tom Selleck's guns and some other neat stuff that was like... What? Awesome. Like his actual that he donated? Um, on loan. He didn't give them to the NRA. He just left Okay. Them. But uh, that's probably the way I would do it, too, if I'm still alive, right? Let him have them. Cause well, he's always been a pretty big proponent of the NRA. I mean, if you remember, he's the one that got ambushed at live on Rosie's show. Sure, but he likes guns, so he just didn't No, absolutely. Damn guns. So uh, they had some guns there that were his and some others. And then uh, we saw their, what is it, the, I think it was the 1903 collection, which was kind of cool. They have basically single 1903 in a nice display. Up in the library, though, so nobody ever gets to see it because they don't have room downstairs. Anyway, so then we went downstairs uh, past the past the range. Underneath the range is the big... Again, just say that one more time. You actually have a range in a building. Now, would you have been able to shoot there, or that was solely to make sure that some of the firearms were functioning for the curation process? No, the range is a fancy range. It's open to the public for the most part, except when we got there. 
we didn't know that it's open to the public unless the wow. police want to use it, and then they close it to the public for the police. So when right. we got there, we actually got there, and we're going to meet up at the range, and we're all getting our shit out, and that's when we figured out the cops had the range that day, so we didn't get to shoot. But you can go in the range. You just can't film in there for whatever reason, but anybody can shoot there when it's normally open. And it's just like any other range, except that it's if you don't like NRA rules, you probably don't want to shoot at the NRA <laughs> range <laughs> at their at the NRA museum headquarters. range. Yeah, <laughs> at their headquarters, they pretty much go by the range rules. So uh, it's an interesting range and everything. But we went under that, and underneath of the range is yeah. their vault, and that's like past all kinds of neat security stuff, and then big vault door, and then basically everybody who's ever donated a gun to the NRA when they die or whatever. Uh, they go in that basement room and it's a big giant room and it was just overflowing with guns So we got to do some video down there And uh, well, didn't you say at the time like it was I don't want to use the term stacked like cordwood But you just oh, yeah. like, I swear you had described it as man The reason that it's in the vault is because it's not in order. It's almost like it was in chaos I wouldn't say it's in chaos, but there are a ton of guns there and I'm sure they know where everything so, is, but there's a ton Have of you ever seen that uh, movie? Uh, what was that? Something about a, a Jones, Miss Jones and the Indian or something? And there's a big warehouse with a bunch of boxes. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Uh, he's Indiana talking. Jones, where they have the box at, like, at the end of the movie. When oh, at the end of the movie. Big yeah, warehouse. The government's warehouse. I got gotcha. you. It's not I was, that. Well, I was making a joke, pretending like I didn't know what it was. Oh, you guys can go watch the video because you can literally see it. But the guns are just out. They're not very. The only ones that were in crates were because they were setting up that museum in San, St. Louis, and they were packing up all the like sporting shotguns and stuff to send to there. Um, and then, I think they had entire collections of people's stuff that they never even unboxed that were going there. That's why they built it. I got the impression because some of it looked like it never came out of a box. Anyway. Uh, that was kind of fell in some of the aisles, but the racks, like if the rack was supposed to hold, like if it had scallops for six guns, it, that rack was holding like 12 or 15 Okay. Guns. Like they were just on top of each other and then up and down so that, you know, muzzles and stocks would fit in the same place kind of thing. Because you can pretty much put any two guns in the same place where supposedly one gun was supposed to go. Rifles, you know? Mm hmm So they were just doing that kind of system all over the place. And, uh, you know, everything had a tag. They know what it was. I mean, there's still guns, and there's still a, an agency, so they still have to deal with, you know, inventory and their shit or whatever. They, they don't get to not keep track of it. But anyway, definitely a cool place. Definitely worth going to. If you're ever in D.C., it's very close, so it's worth, um, you know, taking an afternoon to get over there. It's not huge itself, so the museum itself you can catch in an hour easily, I would say. If you're a super gun nerd, two hours but there's just not enough guns there to really it's not a big enough museum to say spend more time than that unless you really really wanted to hang out with the guns like i say there are tours now though which sounds really cool because although it's designed to be a you can take a self tour you know there's enough signage and push the button and it says stuff at you that and it's not oh, that right big so you can get a tour you know what you're looking at even without a person standing there it's got to be better when there's a person who walks you through and I don't know if you've experienced this, but you go through with one volunteer and then you go through with the next volunteer and they've just got different life less, you know, they've got different lives. So they explain different things differently. And it's usually an experience with each person you go through. I agree with that. We have several different activities out here where we have different volunteers doing, you know, in the capacity that you're talking about. Um, and the one time that I did make it to DC, uh, would you, how you're talking about going downstairs and how small places are or whatever, it's like the DC aquarium was like that at the time. I think it's all changed now and everything. I mean, it was 20-something years ago when I was there. I mean, but, like they like had certain fish in the tanks and all the extra fish were downstairs in a big room flopping around? No, like, you had to go downstairs. It was very small. It may have been the, air quotes, National Aquarium, but, you know, maybe there was, you know, 20 to 30 exhibits for the whole thing. Like, it, it, like it was downstairs in one of those buildings like you're like you're talking about. And to me, I had never been to an aquarium like that was that small or downstairs, like in the basement almost. Like that was that was something new to me uh, at that time. Hmm. But uh, I would definitely go to the NRA uh, Firearms Museum, dude. I, I would definitely do that. 
and yeah, I would that, also try and figure out how to get the Smithsonian to knock it off and and and, well, and let me down there. See for any length of time, and you're there to see stuff. You're not going to see anything unless they've changed it since I was there last. You're not going to see anything at the Smithsonian. They don't have guns out anymore. You know, with Trump in there, maybe there's some kind of Obama scorn gun scorning that could be re removed or something. But uh, I'm not sure how they come up with their exhibits, but. This definitely, if you go to the NRA museum, you know you're seeing guns because that's what it is. I need a doctorate in firearms history or something. There you go. All right. There's there's the way. Well, my battery is showing 50%, so we might as well keep moving along. I'm not sure how much more we got to go here. Let's see. So, Dude, we're doing good. Um, as far as what's left, you know, uh, what I see on here is um, healthy tip. All right, we'll slap that one in there real quick. Keeping in mind the gun or the trigger is the, the part that pulls the trigger is the most important part of the gun. Uh, we're saying eat one vegetable, like eat veg, oh, eat vegetarian one day or one meal. So um, I was going to say, I, I, being a vegan or a vegetarian or whatever, people are always asking questions and whatnot. Uh, I think uh, one way to look at it is just like if it was Mexican food or Chinese food or ribs or so if you just consider it another type of food. And uh, just like you don't eat pizza every day, even if you really enjoy it, you throw other things in there just so you know, make your life interesting. Uh, consider throwing some of those vegetable options in there. It might be a way for you to explore uh, some of the varieties. So in other words, if you like pizza a lot and you go to a Chinese place, you ain't finding a Chinese version of pizza. At some point, you're going to have to find something there that you like. And more than likely, cool. unless you really hate food, you're going to always find someplace, something somewhere that you like. You just didn't know it. And I suspect it might be that way with uh, those kind of plant-based foods. And typically your plant-based foods are better for you just because they don't put a bunch of grease and crap on them. You know, they're usually trying to make them healthy. So I guess that's the concept. If you consider throwing one of those into a meal once in a while or using it as a, a, a daily thing once in a while, then that might be a way for you to transition into. Well, and one of my favorite ways to do what you're talking about is whether it's Thai food, Indian food, and I was trying to think there was another one because they make the dishes taste so good um, that you can definitely order it, you know, vegetarian style with it without meat. And it's still fantastic. Let alone, you know, I mean, if you go all in on, a, on creating a monster salad with all the fixings, it, it can be pretty good. But I find that I do have a tendency to uh, either end up adding egg or cheese or something that kind of ruins it as far as the vegan end of it goes right on so uh with that i think we are into gun channels today yes today we've got uh matt coming up probably very shortly never enough ammo um i believe we got we like shooting later today and do we still have? We might still have a Hawaii Volcano Squad doing the uh, lock and load, actually on Mondays, I believe. And then, uh, of course, tomorrow that leads right into the early watch, I believe. And then uh, we'll kind of take it. We'll play it by ear after that. Yeah, I think that's everything. Uh, then we'll have the Tuesday shows tomorrow. We'll tell you about those. And we'll be stepping right on top of Andalusia Armory again tomorrow. So if you want to not listen to us tomorrow and listen to Andalusia Armory, we'll be on or whatever. Yep. All right. With that, you got anything, Smeggy? Uh, No, not really. Hit or miss tomorrow at 9 o'clock or whatever it oh, is. Yeah, I was going to save that, though. I mean, that's not tonight. Okay. Fair enough. I don't see anything from HVS, but yeah, he's usually running the show, so uh, I'm assuming he's got a show. Tonight. And he's been more consistent on that lately, too. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think that's episode 246. Yep. Can I actually 90. mention something real quick? Actually, sure. I, I just thought of something that I do have. Um, I'm trying to pull it up exactly here, but uh, where the heck was it? Shoot. I'm sorry. I should have been more prepared. I had it pulled up earlier, and then I forgot about it. Um, I'm glad you the, the perfect flow of the show for this. Oh yeah, you know that's that, that's why uh, you guys keep inviting. Did you want to show back. us what it's like on? Did you want to show us what it's like on Hit or Miss show? Oh no, uh, it's much more professional over there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, are you giving up or are you sallying forth? What no, are you doing? Uh, sorry, no, I'm 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 scrolling. Hang on. 
basically it was about here we go in Connecticut the uh, was it the governor or something he wants to change a bunch of the fees for like for the gun permits and stuff like that um, his new like budget proposal increased the pistol permit fee from seventy dollars to three hundred dollars <laughs> And the cost of the initial five-year permit from 140 to 370. And he also wants to increase background check fees from 50 to 75. That sounds like somebody that doesn't want to get reelected. Yeah, so it's it's one of those things. That, uh, Colin Noir actually posted the thing on Instagram, which is what I was looking for. But uh, you know, he mentions a good thing. Hey, man, you, you know, you give them an inch, they take a mile, kind of thing. Because obviously these people already just said, well, okay, we can get a permit. I mean, it's it's kind of annoying, but, you know, 140 bucks covers you for five years. And then I don't know if this pistol permit fee that's the $70, if that's a yearly thing. If it is, go. that's a lot to begin with. But then oh, dude, that might just be three, a permit to purchase the pistol, dude, potentially. Well, I think that's what this initial five-year pistol permit fee from 140 okay. to 370. So I think like you initially you get a permit for five years, and then after the five years you probably have to renew for seventy dollars. But he wants to change that to you renew for three hundred. Dang. Wow. So it's like, and then the in the background check fee going from fifty to seventy five. So that's an extra twenty five bucks. But Did really, it's, Connecticut. Yes. So basically, okay. there's any poor people that own guns there. Exactly. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was getting at. That's why I, I mentioned something when we were talking Ring of Fire was that that was the same type of thing. It's like, oh, you only have a hundred bucks? Well, you shouldn't be able to own a gun, so we're going to make it more expensive. With this we're one here, you, like, you, what, four times more expensive than potentially the price of your item? Yeah. With this, you need $445 just to buy your first gun. And then five years later, like once that initial permit runs out, you need another 300 bucks. And I don't know if that's every year. That is insane. Let alone, the, and not even including the cost of the gun yet, right? Right, right. exactly. Uh, okay, yeah, that is insane. To keep it, it sounds like you're paying 300 bucks at some interval. interval. Right, yeah, however... Yeah, well, we need to this needs to come up on the list of things to keep an eye on for Connecticut, just so we can. I don't know if we have any gun channels members in Connecticut, but we definitely need to keep an eye on this and be vocal because that's, that's some crazy talk, dude. And that's the thing how they're talking about how it's it's part of his budget because that's what they talk about is oh yeah this would raise you know millions of dollars to get rid of the def the three point six billion dollar deficit. Yeah, so it's right. like first off they misspend the well, money they and they're like oh we don't have any more money. Well, what can we do? Yeah. Let's get some blood from the stone. Let's, uh, yep. you know, tax. So I don't know if this is, it's not necessarily a new law because the law is already in there that you have to pay for a permit. They're just changing the number you have to pay now. Well, and here you said it's the governor. So he technically can't legislate that, but he can put it forth to the legislature. Well, I don't I know think for sure if it is. The it, it's Mally or something. Maybe he's the head Congress person or whatever. I don't know. Well, gun channels and YouTube, if you know anything about these new proposals, uh, restrictions uh, for Connecticut, please uh, let us know or give us a link. We'll try and uh, keep everybody updated on this stuff. Much appreciation. And you know what, Smags? That just goes right along with what we've been saying since before he got, uh, uh, Trump got elected is we didn't really win. What we have is a chance. But we still have to do our part to remain vigilant at all times. Keep an eye on stuff. Be vocal, um, because they ain't just they ain't just gonna give it to us. They ain't gonna give us nothing. As a matter of fact, and if anything, they'll take. By that you mean simply sign the so the petitions, like we just got the NFA back or rescinded. So now we just come up with some more petitions, like petition to change. Kinetic. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that oh, if it relate raises a level of awareness to where everybody is uh, informed appropriate to an appropriate level. Uh, they can make more informed decisions when it comes time to either vote or contact their legislator. I hear you. And I think that uh, one of the things Maggie and I plan to do for next month's uh, Every Second Matters, uh, everysecondmatters.com, is to include a list of states. And, yeah, exactly. So that now somebody's going to, uh, I don't know, you know, 
do some kind of business with the state or something, they can take a quick look and make a letter or something. I'd like to to relocate, but your gun laws suck or something. Can create a system there that people can be up to date on what the various state issues are, and uh, stuff like the Colorado. You know that worked out pretty well using uh, the industry to uh, pressure bad law and bad legislature. Yeah. Well, and that didn't go all the way through yet, right? The the magazine okay. stuff, but it is moving forward and it is moving through. So pressure it's not is, done, but it is moving. Right, but pressure is being applied. Magpul oh, did absolutely. Leave. That's 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 forcing people to uh, hold responsible the people that forced them to leave. Really. Well, and well, they did the they, they did what wasn't that like the first ever? Uh, oh my God, what do you call that? Recall election or whatever? Like they kicked two of the people out. They were like, no, nah, dude, you're out of here. That first, was right after. But it was one of the first in recent history for sure. And it may actually have been one of the first in Colorado. You might be maybe right on that. Next. I remember it was something it was something like that. They were like, it's the first, or maybe the first time two of them happened at the exact same time or whatever it was. Well, and that lady that was in the uh, committee or whatever, when she opened her mouth and just revealed how much of a complete moron she was, I think that it had upset enough Coloradan voters that that happened like but, that happened that quick but these are magazines they're ammunitions they get used up is that <laughs> that lady yes that's that lady. Oh, okay <laughs> it is <laughs> yes All right. um, yeah again uh, we have an opportunity here folks um, we have an opportunity to move forward even and if we do nothing, not only will nothing positive happen, but there still can be many negative things that can be taken or negative things that can lead to rights and things being taken from us. Um, if anything, we, ha we haven't won, but we are winning, if you want to look at it like that. So we definitely got to keep, uh, keep the pressure on, like, like Smeggy was just oh. talking about. Partially. Which, you know what, that leads uh, us to the normally the Canadian Bob uh, quote of the day, which is uh, by Pericles. Yes, the ancient Greek. Yes, busting some knowledge. If I could say this in Latin, I probably would, but uh, uh, I'm not going to. Uh, so here it is. Freedom is the sure possession of those alone who have the courage to defend it. So, of course, I just want to say thank you to everybody out there listening to the sounds of our voice. Thank you for the effort. Uh, I think in, in Latin that would be Edom Frey is, or it. Yeah, no. See it. E they, er they. That'd be e -hey. e, e -te. I, the, I, I've never actually heard Latin speak that's spoken. So the only speaking. Latin I know is Quando oh, Omni no. Funcus Morentati. E pluribus unum right. caveat emptor. Vini Vidi Vici. We will see you uh, uh, tomorrow for episode 147. The guys and gals of gunwebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thanks for watching gunwebsites.com.